One of the things that's really fascinating about studying ancient cultures is the ways in which it's clear that the geography of a region really defines the culture that develops there. This was really interesting comparing the culture that we just learned about, Egypt, with the culture that's just a few hundred miles over here to the east, the area that is known as Mesopotamia. Now, this area, that name means the land between the rivers, and it's a reference to this land where we've got the Tigris River on the east and the Euphrates River on the west. They start up here in the mountains, and they come and, come and they both empty out down here into the Persian Gulf. So what makes these two areas, which have obvious similarities, they are both fertile river valleys, they both see great cultures emerge. Well, one big difference is that over here in the Nile River Valley, where Egypt emerges, we've got a different kind of flood that happens annually. We talked about how the, 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 the rainy season down in the rainforest of Central Africa and the hills lead to a gentle rise in the Nile with gentle flooding that is welcomed and is, is seen as a gift from the gods. And so it, it, that combined with plentiful sunshine, plentiful water, Plentiful, plentiful vegetation. It seems to the Egyptians that their gods take care of them, that their gods love them. And so this confidence in, this, in their gods, this confident belief in the, the protection of the gods helps lead to this confident belief in the afterlife. Well, we've got a much different situation regarding floods over here in Mesopotamia. Because while instead of having instead of having gentle floods, what can occasionally happen now, certainly not every year, but maybe once every 50 years or, or something like this, the there will be a heavy, heavy snowpack up here in the mountains where the headwaters of the two rivers uh, emerge. And remember that this is hundreds of miles away from these cities that are down here near, near the mouth of the rivers in the Persian Gulf. So if there is a particularly heavy snowpack and spring comes early, Early, and there is, is, is a, a, a heat wave that melts a whole lot of that snow, then what we can have is huge amounts of flood water. Think about a wall of water, very rapid rise in the rivers. And so it might be a bright, sunshiny day in Uruk or in Ur down here hundreds of miles away when all of a sudden the ground starts shaking and we, 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 there is this wall of water that comes along and simply devastates everything in its way. So um, rather than the trusting relationship that the Egyptians have with their gods, the attitude of the people who emerge in this geographical area, um, their, their attitude is more that the gods are fickle. And what I mean by that is, is sometimes, sometimes they seem to love them and to care about them, but other times they seem not to. And so there is not that same degree of optimism, that same degree of confidence. It's, it's as if the cultures here are constantly looking over their shoulder, waiting for the next thing that is going to happen. Another reason for that is that while Egypt has perfect natural defenses with hundreds of miles of desert on either side and then steep cliffs along the Nile, which um, for the most part keep out invaders and allow for one continuous culture to thrive um, with periods of warfare, certainly, but one continuous culture to, to develop over thousands of years. We don't have those same natural barriers in Mesopotamia, and so we have a, a, whole, a whole series of cultures that emerge there. We've got the Sumerians and the Akkadians and the Neo-Sumerians and the Babylonians and the, and the Assyrians and the, and the Chaldeans or the Neo-Sumerians and, and the Persians, and those are just some of the biggies. And so we've got a really, really different situation. Situation here. So we're going to start in talking about um, the ancient Near East, Mesopotamia, by talking about the earliest of these civilizations. And this earliest civilization um, appeared right around this area, close to where the rivers go into the Persian Gulf. These are the Sumerians. We're going to be talking especially about the White Temple and its ziggurat in the um, early city of Uruk. That's not on this map. But it was very close to the city of Ur that we see right here. And it's in this city that we're going to see some of the most remarkable early developments um, that are pioneered by the Sumerians. So, for example, it was the Sumerians who were the first to use writing somewhere around 3500 to 3300 BCE. This is the first group of people who are going to invent the wheel, probably for use as, um, as a potter's wheel, and then also to apply that wheel to transportation. We're actually going to see the first artistic image of wheeled transportation when we look at the standard of Ur. This is the first civilization to develop the city-state governmental system. Now, each of these city-states, we see the different names of different city-states around here. This is some of them. Each of these, um, each of these uh, had its own patron deity. They would build a temple to this patron deity on top of a massive platform called a ziggurat. So we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about and looking at that in just a minute. These are also the first people who really developed what we might think of as a true division of labor. 
such that you'd be able to have full-time people doing all different kinds of occupations. And the reason for this is that they also developed widespread use of irrigation for farming, which would have helped produce the kind of food surpluses which would have enabled people to, to, to do full-time jobs in other areas. So just all of these different firsts. At the same time that they have all of these different firsts, I want us to recognize that there is an issue with city-states that we are going to see later on when we get to the Greeks. And it was also an issue that we discussed when we talked about the Mayans. The problem with city-states is that even though these city-states share a common culture, they share common foods and a common language and common religious beliefs and, and common traditions, in spite of that, they tend to be at war with one another all the time. And so between the unpredictability of the floods, the unpredictability of warfare, we're going to see a much different culture emerge here. So um, let's move now to talk about the practice that the ancient Sumerians had of creating a temple to their patron deity and putting that temple up on a raised platform. Now let's, let's look at, we're going to go back and we're going to look at that floor plan for one in just a minute, but let's remember that with the danger of the floods, a very practical matter, a very practical reason for raising the temple to their patron deity up onto a tall platform would have been that it would have protected that temple from the floodwaters. But there's another reason why they raised the temple to the, to the deity up on these tall ziggurat platforms. And that is that the Sumerians believed that the gods lived up in the heavens. And so this notion of God being up in heaven actually originated with the Sumerians. Now, they also believed that the deities owned the land. They believed that all of the earth belonged to the gods and the goddesses. Human beings had one purpose, and that purpose was to serve the gods. So again, each city-state built a temple to its patron deity and put it on top of a high base like this. And so the temple itself would, would be a convenient place for the god coming from the heaven, uh, coming down to earth and, and, and receiving offerings from, from the people who were left there by the priests. A sort of stairway to heaven. Apologies to Led Zeppelin there. So um, when we look at the ziggurat, this looks very, very different, doesn't it, from what we think of when we think of the Egyptian pyramids. Now, we are looking at a model, and we might ask, why are we looking at a model instead of this, the real thing? Well, guys, this is what the real thing looks like. It's not real impressive, is it? And so earlier, when we talked about why is it that elementary school children are taught about Egypt and they get these really strong visual images of the pyramids, and yet if you ask them about, if you ask them about the Sumerians, the ziggurats really don't come into their minds. That's because the ziggurats just don't capture the imagination in the same way, do they? Well, when we look at these modern-day photographs of the ruins of a ziggurat, the remains of a ziggurat, what this points out is yet another advantage that the Egyptians had over that the Egyptians had over the people living here um, near the mouth of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and that is why the Egyptians had just huge, limitless quantities of building stone. The people living in these flat plains near the mouth of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers did not have building stone. It was very rare. And so for them to build their temple bases to put uh, their ziggurats to put the temples on top of, what they were going to have to do is the same thing for construction that we see the people in Mali in the city of Jene doing, which is they are going to use mud bricks. And so sun-dried mud bricks, millions of sun-dried mud bricks would have been necessary to be able to build this platform, which ultimately is built in many, many, many different stages, some at least 10 different stages over centuries before it ultimately reached a height of 40 feet. Now, we can tell that there is a slope on the sides. We can see that there are levels that are, um, are horizontal across the top. And so let's go back and let's look at this model. So when we think about a ziggurat, what would we say is a, um, a definition for a ziggurat? It is an imitation mountain for the gods with the temple on top as the home of the gods, and that, that deity resides in the statue that is found in the temple. The mountains were believed to be powerful, the sources of the water that made farming possible. Um, the goddess Minhursag, the great mother and the goddess of the earth, was called the lady of the mountain. And so as temple platforms, the ziggurats also symbolize what Gardner's textbook calls lofty bridges between the earth and the heavens, a meeting place for humans and their gods. 
And so what a ziggurat is composed of is millions of mud bricks. It's got four sides with these long sloping vertical grooves going down the sides in the sunlight that would have been really, really striking. And a major contrast is that while Egyptians had what we call a straight axis approach, one straight walkway that would lead them straight up to the most sacred part of any temple. What we have instead with the Sumerians is what is known as the bent axis approach. And so what that means is we've got the slanting, we've got the staircase on one side that they go up, and then they have to do a 90 degree turn. And so they continue up this ramp, do another 90 degree turn, continue up that ramp, come all the way up to the platform on which the temple stands, and then they've got to do one more final 90 degree turn in order to enter the temple itself. Now once one gets up there, what they're going to be seeing is that this will be paved with white bricks. What they did on top of that mound of all of those millions of mud bricks is they put a layer of bitumen, which is a tar-like substance that is used to pave roads in the modern world. And so on top of that tar, they would lay white bricks. So on top of the dazzling brilliance of that white pavement, what emerges is this, what has been called the White Temple. Now, again, we are talking about the specific temple um, that is found in the earliest of Sumerian cities, the city of Uruk, which was founded by Gilgamesh. Many of you have read the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we believe that the White Temple was dedicated to the god, uh, the god of the sky, whose name was Anu. The outer walls were probably painted white. This is why it's referred to as the White Temple. And so let's take a minute to look at the plan of the temple here, and then to compare that with the model that has been created. We can see that the the plan shows a rectangular form. In the center is the area where the deity would actually reside. This is the most sacred area called the Kela, and right here there would be a kind of stepped altar, and that is where the statue of the deity would reside. And so the notion was that when it when the when the deity decided to come down to earth and visit his temple, that this is where this is what he would inhabit. And so the only people who were ever allowed up here were the priests themselves. They would bring offerings from the people. There would be votive offerings. And so we're going to be looking at some, um, some votive statues that were found buried underneath one of the altars in a different ziggurat in a different city-state. And so um, when we look at this, we can see that there are also these side rooms along the main room of the Kela right here. So this whole structure is about 5,000 years old. The Sumerians were building their ziggurats with their temples on top hundreds of years before the ancient Egyptians started building the Great Pyramids at Giza. The ziggurat temple complex would have been the nucleus of each city-state and certainly would have been the highest building in the city and given the flat landscape that we were that we're talking about would have been visible for miles, a really imposing sight to anyone entering one of these great ancient city states.